Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm not speaking about the reanalysis of uh, the game samples uh, because, uh, well, for the moment we will discuss this uh, together. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, maybe just on uh, Hans' uh, presentation, uh, I think uh, what was very good, Hans, is that you showed also that, of course, you are number one in developing these methods, but uh, you are also collaborating with uh, other laboratories. You name Moscow, Barcelona, Los Angeles. You are working together with us also. And um, uh, the Cologne Laboratory is really uh, working very hard. And uh, also, we are keen to share the knowledge. And uh, we, we, this is very good. And of course, thanks to all this um, advancement, we are able now to, to reanalyze the samples from uh, the previous games. And it's very important. Um, I must uh, apologize for. Uh, Neil absence, uh, Neil Robinson, you, most of you know Neil. He is the specialist of uh, uh, individual uh, biological monitoring or biological passport, let's say, uh, blood passport, as we call. Uh, so Neil was making a presentation. I will try to, to be <laughs> uh, able to, uh, to present the things. Uh, but it will be done in a different way as uh, Hans was presenting. Uh, nothing is new, so it's not a problem for the journalists to be in the room. Uh, it's more to, to put some questions on the table. Um, and uh, of course, we are speaking a lot about the biological passport or biological monitoring in uh, team sports. Team sports are specific, I would say. Uh, it's a bit different as uh, individual sport regarding certainly, you know, training and uh, regarding uh, doping also. Uh, I'm not a sociologist, but uh, I think uh, there are some specific specificity also regarding doping uh, in, um, in team sport. Um, well, we have, of course, so some question, in fact, um, when we are speaking about team sports, um, why introduce a blood passport? What for? How to do to do that? Is that, um, for example, is um, cycling or IWF model fitting for uh, team sport? We are not sure, but first, what we think is in all sport, and specifically in in team sport is certainly to do what we call prevalence study. What is important in the fight against doping, to, to my point of view, and I think we are working on that since we begin to work on blood, uh, blood doping, I would say, is that, um, is that a problem or not? Is that, uh, can, we, can we differentiate population, uh, subpopulation, in, in a sport or in a country, yes. Um, speaking about the country, you will see some of the results we were, uh, we were doing together with uh, track and field. And uh, of course, we know that doping can be different from culture to other cultures. It means the definition of doping is really different from country to country. Uh, and of course, uh, this is one of the difficulty I think for WADA to harmonize, um, to harmonize the fight against doping because it's difficult to harmonize the cultures, and um, and of course we have to see what are the reason why in some countries the prevalence of doping is higher than in other, or in some sports the prevalence of doping is higher than in others. Um, this is an example Mario will remember, of course, it was at the beginning of 2000, when we were working on blood and uh, we were working on follow-up of the cyclists at the time. And um, what came out from different studies is uh, this ferritin. So ferritin is not a forbidden compound, of course, this is the, um, let's say the reservoir of iron you have uh, in the body, in the blood. And certainly in that case, uh, it was linked 
to the wish of the cyclists to increase the synthesis of hemoglobin uh, together with uh, the abuse of EPO. And um, in that case, it was very interesting to see that also this phenomenon, you see here the, these numbers, you know, that uh, normally in a, in a hospital, uh, the highest value should be something around two, 200 or between 200 and 300. And you, you can see that many of those people, in fact, uh, could be uh, designated as ill because, as ill because of uh, too much iron in their body and their blood. And um, what was very interesting in that case, uh, uh, we, uh, we saw that it was depending on the age. It was depending on the age of the cyclist and um, uh, we saw also that uh, by taking some measure, prevention measures uh, at the time, uh, UCI was able to decrease finally uh, the prevalence of uh, high level in uh, ferritin among the cyclists. But we saw also that it was strongly depending on the cultures. It means, you know, in sports medicine also, you have different cultures uh, from country to countries. And uh, you can see that by the use of iron together with, let's say, uh, some doping habits. Here you have, uh, of course, uh, no name for the countries, but you can see that uh, there are significant differences from countries to countries. Most of those are European countries uh, in that case. Um, now, speaking about the prevalence studies, uh, we were speaking about cycling. In that case, uh, uh, this is um, track and field. Uh, track and field, IWF was uh, taking blood samples since uh, 2001. Uh, not to have a no start uh, competition uh, rule, but uh, just for targeting. In that case, uh, and it begins, uh, let's say, around 2000. Uh, blood samples were taken in many, com in many federations in order to better target the athletes, for example, for um, EPO doping or for uh, blood transfusion. And um, the same parameters we, which were introduced in the uh, blood passport, it means hemoglobin level, reticulocytes, or the off-score combination of uh, let's say low reticulocyte, high elevated hemoglobin, uh, those parameters were used to, uh, to make target, uh, targeting uh, the athletes. And uh, in that case, we were able to screen, let's say all these blood parameters from the year 2001 to 2009. And um, uh, almost 7,000 athletes were included in this study. And uh, you can see here the, the black, the two black curves. So this one on, on the left is uh, the curve uh, indicating uh, the prevalence of a negative population. It means a negative population has been followed and this is a statistical uh, um, uh, presentation of the population. This black one is uh, the curve uh, showing the prevalence uh, regarding these, uh, uh, these parameters here. These parameters, in fact, uh, is a combination of all the blood uh, parameters showing or indicating uh, a possible doping. So this curve is showing a doped population, control, microdoses of EPO doped population. This one is a non-doped population. And you see the green curve here. The green curve is representing in this population of 7,000, uh, uh, almost 7,000 uh, athletes, is uh, representing the mean of the woman population. And you can see the blue one is uh, one country and uh, the red one is another country. And the red one is showing, uh, you will see the numbers after, but uh, the red one, you can think that, um, let's say a significant part of that population um, is manipulating with, uh, with blood. Um, yeah, it's maybe not so easy to read, but you can see, so uh, we were saying, uh, this population 
we can look to this column here. This column is a prevalence of uh, blood manipulation uh, with the assumption that the doping habits in that case is microdoses of EPO. And uh, if we look here, so 7,000 athletes, and uh, we can make the difference in the prevalence between endurance and non-endurance disciplines in, in, track and uh, in track and field. What is difficult in track and field is that um, the sport is not homogenous uh, regarding the physiological uh, exercise. It means, of course, endurance and, uh, and uh, sprint is not the same, uh, even if um, in both disciplines, EPO, for example, can be, can be uh, useful. But uh, it's clear that uh, you can make the difference. You see that the prevalence in non-endurance is uh, around 3% in the population. The all endurance discipline, 18% uh, uh, by, by the mean, altogether 14%. So um, Professor Dvorak was speaking about the statistics. Uh, of course, the statistics coming from uh, the WADA laboratories are not completely uh, representing the image of what, uh, what is doping really in the field. And, um, and I think in track and field also the, uh, the statistics from the lab showing a very low uh, prevalence of doping. Um, what is very interesting in that case, it was possible uh, to get a significant image of what happened from countries to countries. And as I said before, for example, looking to the, to the women, uh, uh, you can see a very low incidence in this country D, for example, very low incidence of uh, uh, apparent blood manipulation. And in the country A here, I will not give you the name, but uh, in this country here, you have something around 50% uh, of prevalence of manipulation. So uh, to, to my point of view, it's very important to be, uh, let's say, specific, to, to, to have a knowledge of uh, where, how is the doping problem represented in a different region, different sport. Um, and of course, uh, I will speak a little bit, even if I know that um, Alan Werneck is uh, also showing some things on the biological passport. Uh, we know that we have uh, guideline, guidelines and technical documents. Uh, this is the only way to harmonize, in fact, uh, the approach, because as um, Hans was saying, uh, it's necessary, for example, between labs to have reliable data to be put together in order to have, let's say, uh, a monitoring of a single athlete. And uh, uh, in these um, uh, guidelines, we have a blood collection protocol with different important points, which for, for some of them can be discussed. And I know that uh, we are discussing with football, for example, uh, this uh, timing of sample collection two hours after training. Uh, this is, let's say, it has been seen as necessary to harmonize uh, really all the uh, blood collection protocols in order to get the best pre-analytical conditions uh, to, to get the data. Um, but um, uh, we, we must agree that, um, let's say, uh, we still have to work on these conditions. Uh, we can see that here, for example, uh, we have, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit small, but uh, we are speaking about the exercise and the effect of exercise and the time after exercise uh, when it is uh, uh, reliable to take blood. And uh, here I must say that this experiment uh, is not really showing that these two hours are necessary, but um, okay, I think this is some points to be on the table. We discussed that already with uh, Professor Dvorak. Uh, I think it's really necessary to get the best condition, again, to get uh, the best sample to be analyzed. It, it's always a big problem. It means uh, all these data, all the biological passport, even for the steroid, uh, needs to have the proper sample, the proper condition of collection of the samples in order when the sample arrives in the laboratory, it is in the good 
um, uh, condition to be analyzed and uh, it is in a good condition to give the most reliable and comparable results with other laboratories uh, within the same uh, passport. This is just to, to say that, for example, these 10 minutes of seating to, to guarantee stable hemoglobin, this was also experiment. Uh, it was also a long debate, I think, with uh, some of the NATOs uh, claiming that it would be better to have half an hour. And uh, what is difficult in sport, I would say, is that uh, uh, you need to have preanalytical conditions which, uh, which are fitting with the most reliable uh, data, but you need also to cope with, let's say, the environment of, um, of the athlete, of the players. And it means uh, those people are not prisoners, so uh, I think uh, we need to also to be human in the, uh, the anti-doping approach, uh, and uh, this is uh, quite clear. Uh, blood parameters over time, this is also another discussion uh, here. Yeah, the title is uh, speaking about temperature. I think the temperature problem has been solved uh, with uh, proper containers uh, during the transportation. So it's obvious that those parameters can be, especially hemoglobin, can be affected by uh, increased temperatures. So it must be transported when it is over two or three hours. It must be transported at cool temperature between four and eight or between four and 12, depends on, um, uh, I would say, uh, the specialist. But what is important in that case is um, uh, those two parameters which are involved in the uh, blood passport, it means hemoglobin and reticulocyte, are quite stable. Um, I know there is a discussion now to increase the time uh, between a collection and analysis uh, from 36, or maybe uh, it is already decided, uh, from 36 to uh, 48 hours. Um, what Neil Robinson will say is that other parameters are affected after 36 hours, and because you know that uh, for all this uh, biological passport, uh, we have experts and we have pathologists who must give their uh, expertise on the interpretation of a passport. And if other parameters are affected by uh, the time between the collection and, and the analysis, of course, uh, we must, uh, let's say, at least standardize uh, some of the things, some of the interpretation in that case. So uh, there is still uh, a bit to be done. Of course, um, this is just to say that uh, regarding the analysis, a lot of work has been done at the beginning of the 2000s, of the year 2000, in order to find the best way to analyze uh, in an harmonized manner uh, in all of the laboratories uh, those parameters. And in fact, uh, you all know that um, a special machine or company was uh, chosen in that case because what we realize is that uh, from one company to the other, it, it is well known in the clinical laboratories, uh, from one technology to the other, the answer may change in that case, which is not so much the case with the uh, mass spectrometry uh, devices we have in the anti-doping laboratories. This is the case uh, for uh, this hematological uh, automate because the technology at the base, uh, the calculation of the number of cells, the calculation of uh, what is the measurement of what is a reticular site uh, may change from one company to the other. So it's why in that case it is, I would say, an exception uh, in the fight against the doping. In that case, one technology was imposed to all the laboratories uh, in order to provide to the stakeholders, to the federation, the best, uh, the best analysis as possible. And, okay, um, you all know the principle of, of the passport. We know that uh, at a certain time we had a, a limit, a population limit, for example, for the hemoglobin, which was, depending on the federation, around uh, 170 uh, grams per liter. And, um, uh, I would say that 
the philosophy behind the passport uh, was uh, to solve this problem of uh, sensitivity and specificity. So uh, in a population with a single limit, with a threshold, of course, uh, it's possible uh, uh, it's possible to have some cases with uh, normally and naturally elevated hemoglobin and uh, certainly what was uh, quite evident at the time is that many of the people with a natural level of uh, 150, for example, from the mean, were manipulating in order to be just below this population limit. So it's why um, it was clear and obvious for the, the sports authorities to go more in an individual approach uh, and uh, of course by going in that direction individual approach mean individual limits and uh, this is really the, the basis of, uh, of the philosophy of, a, uh, of the monitoring individual and longitudinal in order to have the athlete or the player as its own control during uh, time. Um, this is a, a bit complex, but uh, this is what is, was proposed in 2009 to, to WADA for the process of the athlete passport at that time. So speaking about the blood uh, passport, speaking about the hematological module of a passport. And um, let's say the message here, of course, it, is, it looks like a complex um, organization, but of course, it means we have several laboratories and these laboratories are all controlled um, in, with internal quality uh, controls and external quality, uh, which uh, is organized in that case by, by WADA. And, uh, okay, we have a database, uh, this is Adams uh, in general, but uh, we know that uh, other federation or ADOs, they may have another uh, type. Uh, of course, Adams in that case for the blood passport is helping very much because everything has been introduced, the software has been introduced in Adams. What for me is important is uh, that uh, we have the anti-doping uh, laboratories um, involved in, I would say, the management of a passport. You know that uh, there is uh, what we call APMU. This is the uh, Athlete uh, Passport Management Unit. And uh, this APMU is dealing with all the results from an individual without to know the names. Uh, and uh, looking for expert, external independent experts to uh, evaluate the passport. And uh, uh, I still personally think that this unit must be linked to the laboratories because we have in our own rules, uh, you know, we work uh, anonymous, we are not biased, we have an ethical code uh, which is well described and uh, I think in that organization and it will be even more in the organization of the steering module for the passport that the laboratory network must be uh, clearly and closely involved. And these are uh, passports, in that case uh, you see that there are many data uh, this is clear that uh, it could be done, it can be done in some sports where many uh, samples are taken on individual sports. Certainly it will change a little bit uh, with uh, team sports and uh, just to show that in some cases it works. Uh, even I can give you the name because those people are all speaking. So this is Tyler Hamilton case. Um, he admitted that at that time he was uh, uh, blood transfuse, in fact, uh, twice, and uh, so these data have been already published. And uh, uh, in that case, uh, the hemoglobin was increasing after uh, transfusion. Uh, you can see here the reticulocyte. This is a normal feedback regulation by down, um, uh, you know, a down feedback regulation. The reticulocytes are, are below the lowest um, value for, for the athlete and the off score is, as we said, a combination between elevated hemoglobin and, um, and a low reticulocyte and this is uh, clearly outside of the norms. 
In, in that case, uh, the, the athlete was, the rider was not called for that. He was called for homologous blood transfusion, but uh, of course, this so-called passport was used to increase uh, the uh, evidences of uh, the transfusion. So now in, in conclusion, we think still that regarding blood doping, uh, regarding specific sports, we need to, uh, to evaluate to make a risk assessment. It's uh, very important to see if there is a problem or if this is not a problem in some sports in order to focus on more, uh, I would say, reliable things and uh, more important things uh, in, uh, in that sport. It's important to target the right population. Uh, we know through the cycling experience that, um, uh, and I think Mario will <laughs> agree with that, uh, it is very efficient in deterring, uh, deterring uh, doping habits in some sport because we all know that uh, to have this individual follow-up uh, is not making so easy the manipulation for, uh, for, um, for the athletes who want to cheat. So the deterrent effect is present and I think it's not so clear for the moment, but I think that on a long-term basis uh, we will have a increase in the efficiency cost ratio uh, in, in the fight against doping. Okay, that's it. <laughs>